through the Audubon chapter of Minneapolis uh, launch program for the fall of 2020. We're so glad to have you with us. Um, we look forward to having online uh, programs each month um, while we uh, manage to survive together through this uh, pandemic. Um, we are um, continuing to um, do our chapter activities uh, routinely. We have our board meetings, our committee meetings, um, some ongoing conversations all uh, via Zoom. Um, and there are also um, a number of opportunities to do face-to-face -face activities as well. And you can get more information about that uh, later in the program. Uh, but to start with, let me simply invite you um, to report what you're seeing by way of birds these days. The, um, the fall migration south is certainly underway for a good many species. Um, a fair number of people are uh, posting photos of fall warblers coming through and a few other people are expressing their deep frustrations with trying to identify fall warblers. So if you use your um, the function on your screen that allows you to ask a question, if you'll simply uh, raise your hand um, on the uh, on your chat function. Um, Irene will uh, call on you, and you'll be able to share your report of what you've been seeing so far this fall. Don't be shy. Let us know what you're seeing. Oh, Lisa Keitel had a black and white warbler. Very good. And, and William O'Brien on Saturday. Laura Halbert says she worked at a bird rehab center in Florida for a while and her favorite patients were always the brown pelicans. I'm glad to see there are other people who really enjoy them, she says. Are other people ready to report, um, especially uh, migrating passerines or has anyone been up on Hawk Ridge in Duluth to report on raptors passing through up there? Lots of hummingbirds, says Erica at the University of Minnesota Arboretum. I was over at the Longfellow Gardens here in South Minneapolis last week and uh, I went um, three, three afternoons out of four and saw nothing but butterflies and beautiful flowers. There simply were no hummingbirds at that time. Um, I'm guessing that I haven't been over there in the last four or five days. I'm guessing now that there'd be a good number of hummingbirds there as well. This is Katie. I've else been have... seeing lots of hummingbirds, but uh, also um, in Minnesota and also where I am in the Central Flyway right now, uh, lots of common nighthawks on the move. Oh. And one of our board members, David Hartwell, came through Duluth last week and reported what he thought might have been 500 uh, nighthawks over Duluth the evening he went through. Um, and there were lots of uh, warblers and other passerines on the north shore of Lake Superior, working their way towards Minneapolis, I'm sure. Anyone else want to offer what you've been seeing? We've got 26 participants, so I'm sure there are some act, active birders in the mix. Well, um, as we go on with the program, um, later in the program, uh, you'll have more opportunity to um, chip in with your reports if you'd like to. I think because we have just an exciting program to offer you this evening, let's go ahead with that. Um, so I'll uh, transition now to uh, Katie Burns, who co-chairs co -chairs our 
um, Community Engagement Committee and works on the planning for our programs. Um, Katie, thanks for your work on this and let's get it started. Thank you very much. Well, thank you everyone for attending uh, this program tonight. I know uh, certainly at this juncture and even a month ago, um, so many people were expressing sort of the exhaustion of being tied to a computer screen, but I promise you this will be very interesting and engaging and fun. Um, I have no doubt that you will enjoy this program. Uh, we are so glad to have Juita Martinez uh, with us this evening to tell us a little, uh, or maybe a lot about the work that she does uh, studying brown pelicans in coastal Louisiana, uh, really trying to get a better idea of how humans are impacting these birds as we change their habitats. Uh, they have a really interesting history, and I think that uh, these pelicans, they really deserve a lot more love uh, than they are getting. They're so charismatic, and they might be a little bit stinky and a little odd looking, but uh, they are amazing, and I could think of no better person to come and, and sing their praises and share with us what's going on with these incredible dinosaurs. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and turn the screen over to Juita, and uh, if you could start out by telling us um, just a couple tidbits about yourself and how is it that you ended up uh, focused on brown pelicans and kind of what got you interested in science in the first place? Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Juita and I'm currently a third year PhD student at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And I actually got into working with the brown pelicans because I worked for Richardson Bay Audubon Center in San Francisco, California. And that was my first experience really working with seabirds, water birds, wading birds. And um, my current advisor actually made a post and that post included brown pelicans. And I was like, that seems really cool. And I kind of just went for it and I got accepted and all of my previous research lined up with this current research project pretty well, um, which I will talk about a little bit in this presentation. Am I able to share my screen now? Or, oh. Yes, you should be oh, yeah. able to. Cool. Awesome. One second, everyone. Okay. I think you should all be able to see it. Oh, sorry. Wrong button. <laughs> we do not need that. <laughs> sorry. Technical difficulties. Sorry about that. Oh, I'm not going to let me full screen away. Sorry. Okay. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. Awesome. So today I am going to talk a little bit about um, how brown pelicans have persevered through a lot here in coastal Louisiana. And just to start off with a little bit of background, this story um, starts in Louisiana. And prior to me moving here, um, I only really knew about Louisiana for Mardi Gras and maybe for swamplands and nothing really like i really didn't know all the issues that are found here in louisiana um and especially that of the brown pelican so the brown pelican is a huge symbol for the state here not only is it the state bird um but it's also the mascot for a basketball team it plays a large role in the culture um, and even as a symbol of resilience and hope for the state, um, mostly because the state is in, a, in this current state of losing a lot of land at a very quick pace. Um, I will point out that this, uh, hopefully you can see my little mouse. This is not a brown pelican, <laughs> but it is the state flag. So somebody made an oopsie back in the day. Um, just wanted to clear that up. And so I'm not sure if anyone out there has ever heard of this, but we like to call this a town on stilts. 
So this is actually near one of my field sites. And a field site is just where I happen to be studying brown pelicans because they're nesting in this area. Not like in the town, but like right offshore. Um, and houses along our coastline are actually built like 10, 15, 20 feet off the ground because flooding here gets that high. And this was a, it was a shock to me. I didn't even know houses were built on stilts like this. And it's kind of cool, but you also see the other side of it where this is how it has to be just for these houses to be able to be in this location. Um, and I thought this was one of the most interesting things that I've ever seen. So Louisiana has a very, very productive coastline. And what I mean when I say productive coastline, there's a lot of resources here. And um, it kind of reminds me of the hustle and bustle of Los Angeles, which is my hometown. And things that I run into when I'm headed to my field sites are things like shrimp boats. There are shrimp boats everywhere. Um, another resource that we see extracted a lot in southern Louisiana is oil. And so things like the oil platforms, um, like the picture on your right hand side. And unfortunately, all of these things that are being extracted by us humans, such as shrimp, fish, oil, all can cause the brown pelicans to become a vulnerable species because they are also using these resources and things like oil spills unfortunately happen quite often, even at a really, really small scale. I'm going to actually take us back a little bit into the history of brown pelicans um, and just give you all a little bit of explanation as to why conserving them now is such a big deal here. So in the 1940s, there was a thing called DDT. It was used worldwide, basically. Um, and the reason why they sprayed DDT was to get rid of mosquitoes. And I can tell you, as someone from California, the mosquitoes here are pretty bad. I can see why they did it. Unfortunately, back in the day, they didn't realize all the repercussions of using DDT. It entered the water system and it was absorbed by smaller things such as zooplankton and then fish bigger than that. Um, and basically caused this magnification of DDT. So birds like the brown pelicans, which are really at the top of the food chain, um, they had high concentrations of DDT in their systems, which made it so that their eggshells were super, super thin. So anytime the brown pelican parents would try to incubate their eggs and keep them warm, they would just end up squishing them or the eggshells wouldn't form at all. So that was a huge problem. Most of us know the DDT story when it's connected to the bald eagle, right? Um, so the same thing that happened to the bald eagle basically happened to Louisiana's brown pelicans. Reminder, it is our state bird here. So I thought this was a really easy way to just show everybody um, what happened um, to the state bird. And basically in 1919, um, there was about 50,000 that were counted, which is a lot. Oh, Sorry. Um, and by 1938, there were 5,000 birds or nesting pairs that were surveyed. And, actually, and by 1961, they were all gone from Louisiana. Louisiana lost its state bird, um, which is really sad when you think about it. Um, and that's a very short period of time to have a bird completely disappear from an entire state. Um, Good news, it is not all doom and gloom, I promise, it's gonna get good. And so there was a joint effort between the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries and the Florida Game and Freshwater Fish Commissions, I know, long names, very big agencies, basically came together and the public also helped and they started something called a translocation program. So what does that mean? Translocation basically means removing animals from a very, you know, a fairly good, healthy population to a place where there are very low in numbers or they used to be there. And Florida did have a fairly better population back in the day. And so they thought it would be 
a good idea to transplant um, fledglings. So these birds, um, they were born that year and they were moving about 110 brown pelican fledglings from Florida to Louisiana. The really cool thing is someone had to feed them, right? They were still dependent on their parents. So they actually clipped the wings of these brown pelicans um, and fed them just so that they would have the instinct for when it's time for them to raise their own chicks to come back to Louisiana and not to Florida. So just a little bit of a background on Louisiana's coastal land loss. It is a huge, huge problem here. Um, and it threatens the brown pelican population once again, even though we have recovered the population from local extinction, they are now facing a slew of other threats. Um, so the picture on the bottom right corner, as you can see, those lines are not naturally made. The buildings of levees and flood control structures along the Mississippi River actually altered the hydrology and upset the balance between land loss and land gain here in Louisiana. So these rivers would normally ebb and flow and move at their own like way. And basically when they did this, they would deposit sediments along the way. But since we've controlled all that natural movement, we no longer get a large deposit of the sediment, which would then help build up our coastlines. Um, so things like invasive species are something else that um, also contribute to this coastal land loss. And the picture that just came up is actually of Nutria. And um, they're basically really large rodents looking invasive species. And what they do is they consume vegetation. And this vegetation is meant to help stabilize the soil on the coastline. Um, they're also an issue for ground nesting birds, such as terns, skimmers. Um, they, pelican eggs are probably a little too big for them to eat, but I wouldn't put it past them. Um, we also see things such as subsidence. So this is an elevation. Um, this is how the USGS measures elevation. And as you can see, the top of that um, round measurement, um, that's how much that soil has sunk. And basically, not only are we losing land, but our land is also sinking here, like literally sinking. Um, on top of that, we also have sea level rise. And as some of you may know, tropical storms, hurricanes, things like that are pretty common around here as well. We just had Hurricane Laura hit um, southern Louisiana. So this is just um, an animation of the land loss that Louisiana's coastline has faced between 1932 and 2016. I hope you guys can see my mouse, but um, my mouse is on the upper right hand corner and it's actually showing the date of the land loss. And I'm just gonna let this play for a little bit just so you all can see all of that open water that ends up being there because of the land loss that we've seen here. Um, just to maybe hit it home a little bit more, we've lost the amount, the same amount of land as the size of Delaware in this amount of time. Um, I know Delaware is not a huge state, but that's still quite a bit of land to be losing. So I mainly work on something called barrier islands. And barrier islands are these land formations um, that are right at the southern tip of Louisiana. And these arrows are actually pointing to all the islands that I work on. And um, this is actually the model for what would happen in 50 years if the state of Louisiana did nothing at all. If there was no restoration, if there was no human involvement, this is how much more land we would lose in 50 years. And that includes every single brown pelican breeding site. And that's super scary to think about, I know. But again, Good news. So the Louisiana is doing 
everything in their power to fortify the coastline as well as help restore barrier islands. And I'm going to just focus on barrier islands because that's the habitat that brown pelicans utilize here. And um, just to give you some quick facts, um, 327 miles of levees have been improved. They have um, secured $21 billion for restoration. And since 2007, 60 miles of barrier islands have been restored, which is amazing um, and always good news for the brown pelicans here. Okay, I thought this was really interesting when I first learned about it. So I just wanted to give everyone listening in um, just a little bit of a background on how restoration works because it, when, when I'm on the ground and they're currently doing restoration, it's incredible to watch. So usually the first step is something like putting in miles of pipeline. So this pipeline not only goes onto the land, but it's going into the ocean for miles up until they reach something called a shoal. And a shoal is basically just an area with a lot of sand. Um, and Basically, what these pipelines do, also these pipes are massive. <laughs> They're really, really big pipes, um, as one can imagine. And it takes a lot of energy to be pumping sand and sediment from one location, like X miles away, all the way to a barrier island. Um, and but that's basically what they do. They just pump a bunch of sediment. It takes months to complete a restoration project, if not years. Um, and once they have the sediment has been pumped onto the land, they basically have to spread out the sediment. So when you think, you could think about it like frosting on cake. You have to spread it out so that it actually makes, like it's flat and is usable for wildlife, as well as usable for planting vegetation on. So just to give everyone um, an example of what a restoration project would normally look like. This is this island is called Queen Bess, and it's actually one of the islands that I walk on. Pelicans utilize it, so I study them on this island. On the left hand side, this is what the island looked before um, October of 2019. And that's when they started the restoration project. And so this year, when I went back and um, the pelicans were there and breeding by February, March, um, this is what it looked like. And let me tell you, <laughs> last fall when I would go onto this island, I would, I would be swimming because I have to walk around the whole island because I survey the birds. And I basically half swam my way across this island all, of the, all season. And now it's like a dream to walk on. As you can see, it's night and day. Um, I just really want to point it out real quick. They also added something called um, breakwaters here. And that is to stop any storm surges from destroying the, the beach. There's all, this is kind of hard to see, but there's also this retaining rock wall completely surrounding the island. So not only did they pump sediments onto the island, there was, there's a lot of rock movement going on too that's used to stabilize the island. Um, this is just another example of the breakwaters on another brown pelican island called Raccoon here in southern Louisiana. Um, Raccoon does not have a barrier of rocks around it, but it has these uh, massive um, water breaks as we saw with Queen Bess. And something that is really crucial for all of these islands is planting vegetation. So the roots of the vegetation um, have been shown to just keep the sediment in place. And there's a lot of hard work going into making sure that not only is the restoration successful, but that these plants are also established because brown pelicans use these plants to build their nests. So all of this is needed for their survival. Um, just some background information on their breeding population. Um, we can ignore the figure at the bottom. It might be a little much. This was taken from a paper by Selman et al. in 2016. And they found that the peak brown pelican population happened in 2005 prior to Hurricane Katrina. 
Um, we have actually not seen these numbers happen again since 2005. Um, so we do see like some ups and downs depending on, for example, the oil spill happened in 2010 and the years following that their population was not as great. And we also have hurricanes that hit. So it's an ebb and flow with their population size. Um, certain things um, like flooding, for example, this is a nest, like right in the beginning of the breeding season. Um, I'm hoping you all can see, but this nest is completely flooded. Um, the eggs are no longer viable. Um, this is the number one cause of mortality that I have found in my research actually is the nest sites flooding. Something else that we see um, out here in terms of human impacts is fishing line. I see fishing line all the time. Every time I go out to these islands, fishing line is caught on a pelican. And if they're lucky, they're still alive and I can free them, but that's usually not the case. Um, a little bit more about the sites that I go to in order to study these brown pelicans. Um, the ones that are in triangles are, have been restored and the ones that are in squares have been unrestored. So we're using restored and unrestored islands to see if there's a difference in brown pelican populations on these two different island types. So is all this money, this hard work um, beneficial for brown pelicans or not? is basically what I want to know. Um, a way that we can, that I am actually utilizing in order to better understand the brown pelican population here is with leg bands. And this is a really, really neat way that we can monitor the brown pelican population for a really, really long time with very minimal disturbance. We just have to catch them once um, and preferably we're catching them as fledgling so they can't really fly yet but they're big enough that they can handle bands um so for the banders in the audience um i know that there's generally banding pliers so there's specialized pliers out there that you can utilize with any given band especially for like passerines and smaller birds um but unfortunately they don't make those for brown pelicans. So I have to use needle nose pliers and some skills to get the bands on perfectly. But if anyone out there wants to make banding pliers for brown pelicans, let me know. <laughs> so band reciting basically means I go out there with a spotting scope with my binoculars. And um, this is actually a photo that I took. So I also have my camera with me. And I got lucky having to see the band, caught the photo, and then I could read the band. So with USGS, we can actually track down and see where these pelicans were originally banded on. So it, because of land loss, these brown pelican islands have been lost since the early 2000s. Um, if they were banded on this island and we spot them on a different island, we can safely say that they have moved islands. And if we don't see them, we can say that they're probably no longer in the area, um, which is a really good thing to know. So if they are stick, sticking around, there, there isn't as much of a need to restore all the islands versus if they're leaving, once their natal sites are gone, then restoring these islands becomes more crucial. I just wanted to show you all these, this picture because I think it's so cool. Um, this camera trap actually captured a band on it, which um, I will say band reciting is so difficult. It's like looking for a needle in a sea of pelican legs. <laughs> um, and it, I just happened to get really lucky and I got this band. So yeah, talking about camera traps, this is another way that I, um, study brown pelicans, I'm really big on minimizing disturbance. I want them to live their best lives and not have me in their business all the time. And camera traps are being utilized in, so we can follow nests throughout the breeding season. Are the nests successful? What are the survival rates? How often are the chicks being fed? Um, if there is predation, what is predating them? Also, we can, all, we can tell when there is a flooding event. And I will show you 
some of the pictures that we've gotten, um, just to give you an idea of what I'm looking at on a day-to-day -day basis. So this is an example um, from one of my camera traps. This is from 2018. And as you can tell, I label each nest with a specific number and um, each nest gets its own identification number basically and we can clearly see how many chicks are in each nest and they are super cute i know um we can also see things like how often are the chicks being provisioned it's pretty obvious um every circle is a parent feeding a chick so we know how often they're being fed um throughout the day which is pretty cool because there's no other way we would find that out without these cameras um, Something else we could find out is if there's any interspecies or intraspecies um, uh, conflicts out there. And here we could see there was a same species conflict. We can also see behavioral things such as preening, and which are which is what these two brown pelican parents are currently doing. Another part of my uh, studies includes vegetation. Like I mentioned earlier, vegetation is super, super helpful in keeping these islands intact and also providing um, nest substrates for the brown pelicans. And things that I'm looking for is like how many different plant species are found on this island. And on top of that, how tall are these plants? So certain plants like mangrove are essential to pelicans having a place to nest. If their nests are above the ground, it's less likely that they're gonna flood. And like I said earlier, flooding is a huge, huge problem and the main way that we lose eggs and chicks um, here in Southern Louisiana. Another thing that I'm looking at is elevation. So, how high is the island compared to sea level? And let me tell everybody, it's not that high. It's about three feet, give or take um, a few inches. And um, how does this change on a year by year basis? So in 2018 versus 2019, and now in 2020, especially after such a big hurricane like Hurricane Laura, um, we are also looking at the differences in elevation on restored sites versus unrestored sites because the restored sites are getting a bunch more sediment deposited on them. So we are expecting them to be higher in elevation. Okay, here's a little bit more of a, the fun side of things. We're putting telemetry tags. I am actually working with um, Dr. Brock Geary, a former USGS ecologist, now professor at the University of Louisiana at Lafayette. And we're putting these telemetry tags on adult brown pelicans. So I know someone's gonna ask this most likely, how do, how do we catch adult brown pelicans? Um, one, you have to have a permit. So don't go out there touching wildlife if you don't have a permit or the training to do so. But basically we run really, really fast and catch them with our hands. <laughs> um, and once we do that, we put the tags on them and we're able to follow their movements every 15 minutes throughout the entire breeding season, which gives us invaluable information on what sites they're using to fish. How often are they coming back to the nest? Things like that. So I wanna know, um, if parents are coming back to the nest more often, is it more likely that their chicks are going to survive? My guess is yes, but we need this data in order to show that that is true. Just to give everyone a quick look at what these telemetry tags look like in that orange box. Um, basically, we put a backpack on them. Uh, we make these backpacks uh, on site, like when we have the pelican in our hands and the tags sit on them pretty nicely. They're not bothered. I actually saw a pelican that we had put a tag on last year, this year. So it's doing pretty well. So just to give everyone a little bit of an insight on 
one of the things that I'm doing with the GPS tagged adult brown pelicans. Everything in the light green color is restored marsh. And just to remind everyone again, this costs millions of dollars to do. So they don't restore the marsh to benefit birds or any wildlife. They're, me they're mainly restoring these areas in order to help protect human lives and um, human infrastructure, which are just as important. Um, so I'm looking at the wildlife side of things just so that with this data, I'm hoping that we can recommend some better use of monies to where we're also benefiting wildlife while also benefiting humans. And so I can tell by the GPS tracking how much time they're spending in these restored areas. Um, so if they're spending a lot of time in these restored areas, that means the restoration is doing some awesome things for pelicans. But if they're not spending a lot of time in these restored areas, then the restoration isn't doing much for them, which we don't want. We want them to be utilizing the good spaces. Um, just to give another example, this at the bottom, each color, the red, the yellow, and the green, are three different adult brown pelican tracks um, throughout the whole breeding season. So as you can see, they move around quite a bit. Um, and the orange square, it matches up with the orange square at the top, in the, on that top photo. And as we can see, they're kind of using the restored marsh areas. Um, not all of them restored marsh areas. So we're gonna take this into like statistical land and figure out if there's a significant usage or not, which I won't get into because that's really boring. <laughs> so just for some like super simple preliminary results, we have found that restored islands have higher hatching success. So on restored islands, we see brown pelican chicks hatching more often than on not restored islands, which is a huge, huge win for the brown pelican population. Um, we also, oh, sorry. Oh, I don't know what's going on. Oh, sorry, everyone. Not sure what's wrong with the slide here. We also see an increase of nest success um, on restored islands. So by nest success, I mean, at least one chick like grew up and flew away. The ch at least one chick made it from each nest uh, or one chick made it from the nest more often on restored islands versus unrestored islands, which is another win for the restoration projects as well as brown pelicans. We also saw that more chicks fledged on restored islands altogether versus unrestored islands. Um, so here is a little bit of my field work mishaps because I get asked this question quite often and things go wrong all the time. <laughs> um, so this is one of my favorite photos. I actually took this photo from the boat. But when you have a 16 pound adult pelican on your camera trap, let's just say the camera trap is no longer facing the way that you wanted it to face. It's probably facing downwards a little bit, which we don't have that kind of room for air. <laughs> so this was not fun to see that this brown pelican had single-handedly ruined two weeks worth of photos. Um, something else that happens, the arrow is pointing to our boat, which is it's pretty far away. I'm actually on the island taking a photo of this while my two field techs are spinning in their kayak because there was this huge like gust of wind that just kept coming and sometimes the kayak spins so it took us a lot longer to get to our boat than we normally would have taken um this is my least favorite the poop covered camera trap um here's an up close of a camera trap i guess and unfortunately we couldn't get any photos from them because they're covered in poop. <laughs> so also it was really hard to get the camera off as one can imagine with the Louisiana heat and the seabird poop. It makes really good glue. 
in case anyone was wondering out there. <laughs> oh, oh, is my video playing? I'm hoping my video is playing. But here's a video of me trying to get the camera trap off of the pole so I could replace it with a brand new and fresh camera. But it, it, it took a minute. It was, it was pretty gross too, not gonna lie. <laughs> Um, there is a, there's something called fire ants here in southern Louisiana. They are also an invasive species from Central and Southern America. And they, they're called fire ants because when they sting you, it feels like there's a burning feeling happening. And occasionally, they mistake my camera traps um, okay, you stay in the as bag. a home. Camera traps so, have been hijacked by these ants. Oh no, it's on me. There's one on me. <laughs> <laughs> and as you can see, me and my lovely friend who came to help me out this day were not stoked about seeing these fire ants in my camera that I needed to remove. <laughs> um, they are quite painful. Okay. Oh. Um, and our most common mishap, <laughs> which is really sad to say, is occasionally the boat just stops working. Um, we're not even sure why half the time that it has stopped working. That's me in the hat looking very sad to um, our, the person who's saving us from LDWF, which is Louisiana Fish and Wildlife Services. Thank you to them for giving us a tow because we were literally stuck in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Something that hit hard this year was Tropical Storm Cristobal. It hit Queen Bess, which I showed a picture of it being restored earlier. And um, all of the younger chicks did not make it through that storm. So these storms really, really have a huge impact on seabirds, brown pelicans, as you can see in this photo, a roseate spoonbill. Um, so climate change is really another thing that is just hard hitting on the seabirds that utilize coastal Louisiana as a breeding ground. Uh, just to hit it home a little bit, um, none of the terns and skimmer colonies, all of them were gone when I came back after tropical storm Cristobal. And just to show you, their, their eggs were scattered. All of those arrows are pointing to either a tern or a skimmer egg. Um, these storms are so powerful that they moved the island so far in that it buried my camera trap. Um, so on the right hand side, I'm about 5'7", and these poles are six feet tall with the foot of the pole being underground and five feet of the pole being above ground. And on the left hand side, that was after hurricane, I mean, sorry, tropical storm Cristobal it had buried my camera trap about two and a half feet, uh, which was not great. And just to give you a little bit of a video, that's about two and a half feet. My lovely assistant is on her knees. So as you can tell, there is a huge height difference from when I left the camera and when we come back. So there was about 10 feet of exposed peak. I'm, I'm, I'm approximating this, so 10 feet of movement of sediment movement just from one storm. And I actually don't know the results of what Hurricane Laura did because I won't be going back out there until next February. Just to give everyone, all of that really dark sediment was not there prior to the tropical storm. So although pelicans are super, super resilient, things like human trash, they happened to use this massive piece of plastic as a nesting substrate. And that's just really, really sad to see that the photo that you're looking right now was taken 30 kilometers off the nearest mainland. That's pretty far, it's an hour boat ride. Um, and you can help by making sure your trash ends up in the trash can and in the landfills versus like on the ground somewhere, Littering does not help brown pelicans or any wildlife out there, actually. So although brown pelicans are really, really resilient species, they could really, really use human help. And without us, there are not going to be any brown pelicans. But with us all working together with the restoration projects that are happening here in Louisiana, 
I hope that they will be able to thrive for many more generations to come. And with that, I would love to take any questions anyone might have. And thank you all for listening. Thank you, Joita. That was so great. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to give uh, Irene an opportunity to look through and see what questions um, there were. Give people a chance to kind of catch up here. So, yeah, thank you, Joita, so much. That was an amazing presentation. Um, so anybody in the audience, please, if you have any question, you can put it in the chat or in the Q&A, and I will I will get those and ask to eat other questions. Um, and if no, yeah, there we go. Okay, just one sec. So uh, we have a question, Rita, um, and this person is asking, is there plastic consumption by the brown pelicans or in their nest? Um, so I'm actually not studying the plastic side of things and microplastic, but with the information that we have out there, there's a really, really good chance that at least microplastics, so really, really small pieces of plastic are entering their digestive system and even our own, dig like human digestive systems too. So it's a really, really big problem. But to answer your question, yeah. Great, no, thank you. And we have a couple of questions from Terence. And so uh, we have, the first question is, how old are the pelicans when they breed? They, they can start breeding when they're two, two years old, but they're not that good at it. And they also don't have the breeding colors. So the, real, the white head and the brown body are mature adults. And that's what ha that they get that breeding plumage at three years of age. And that's when they're a lot better at being able to raise chicks. Right, and kind of a follow-up on that. So how often do the pelicans nest? So once they reach the three years of age, they will nest every year for the most part. Um, and they will come back to the islands that they were born on. And unfortunately, when that island is lost, we're, not, we're actually not sure where they go when they're, where their natal sites are gone. Right, I think, oh, can you hear me okay? <laughs> yes. All right, thank you. Yeah, it's my internet slowing down. But um, we have, so you mentioned that, you know, you run after the pelicans to, to put the GPS on, but for banding, um, are, um, Zora is asking, uh, are pelicans aggressive when you capture them for banding and how do you protect yourself? Oh, yeah, they, they don't like us, which is good and they want nothing to do with us, with us, they they will try to like, their beaks are pretty big. They will, they will snap at us. And it, the chicks, the fledglings, they don't hurt that bad, but the adults definitely do. And honestly, we just, we just deal with it. Um, they have really sharp claws too, or nails on their webbed feet. So I have quite a few pelican um, scars to remember them all by. <laughs> mm. Uh, so we have a lot of good questions here. Um, so another one is besides human threats, what are the major predators of pelicans? Oh, that's awesome. So they actually breed on these barrier islands that are completely surrounded by water. So they, they don't really have a ton of predators, but if, if a raccoon or something like that got onto the island, um, that would definitely be a problem. Rats would be a problem. I haven't seen either of these two species on any of these barrier islands. Um, really, the big, big, like the huge thing that is threatening their population right now is just the complete loss of an island, which happens so frequently. Um, I'm pretty sure Hurricane Laura just took out one of their islands and mm -hmm. it's an unrestored island. Well, so kind of along those lines, um, so do the pelicans have site fidelity and like, do they return to the same site to nest? Yes, they 100% have nest site fidelity, um, which is why when I was saying that their, their entire island disappears 
um, that becomes a problem because we don't know what happens to them and where they go after that. Um, we hope that they would move and just nest on a nearby island, but there's always this chance that they leave the Louisiana population altogether, which is not a good thing because we already lost the brown pelicans here once and we don't want to see that happen again. Yeah, um, and actually uh, how, what, are, what percentage of banded birds do you recite? I know you said it was very difficult. It's very small. Um, I want to say like 10, hmm. if that. Yeah, it's a very, very small percentage. And then we have a question from Umanga. She's asking, are there any on ongoing threats to pelicans such as what happened with DDT? Um, DDT is no longer a problem um, as like as much in Louisiana that I know of, but things like oil spills, like even the really, really small ones that happen on a daily basis and especially those really, really big oil spills, which when you have so many oil platforms, we have hundreds here in Southern Louisiana, hundreds of oil platforms and drilling rigs um, or wells. Um, so it's not that the oil spills may not happen, it's more when. We know it's gonna happen. So that, that's always a scary thing to think about. Yeah, big threat. <laughs> So we have a, a few more questions. I mean, you're getting like a lot of these questions. So this is great uh, engagement from everybody. Um, a couple of questions about their biology. So one is about migration. Do they migrate? And if so, where do they, do they migrate to and from? Oh my gosh, I, I actually just learned part of this. So yes, they do migrate um, and they migrate to Central America. But after Central America, we actually don't know if they go all the way to Southern America. Um, and I just learned this from a pelican expert. Um, and basically, not all of the pelicans will migrate. They will actually choose whether or not to migrate on any given year. So for example, if they migrate to Central America this year, that does not mean they're gonna migrate to Central America next year. They might stay in Louisiana, which I found so cool. But we don't know why, we don't know what triggers whether or not an individual brown pelican will leave or stay. Um, there is like things such as food resources. So if half the population leaves and half stays, there might be enough food resources for everyone to be okay. Um, so things like that. But we actually, we actually don't know for sure. More, more, more studies to come. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So and in terms of the range and, you know, have has the range have changed? And also uh, kind of a double question, uh, do they ever nest on the coast uh, instead of the islands? Yeah, so these islands are actually on the coastline. Um, they are the first pieces of land that you see if you're heading north from the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and they, they literally just stick to the coast. Very rarely will you see them inland unless a huge storm hits and they get thrown off course. Um, what was the other question? Was it range? Yes, range. Sorry. Yeah, I threw them both at you. <laughs> yeah. Can you clarify what you mean by range? Like how far they're flying? Or? Um, so I, I'm not sure who answered, so who asked that question, but um, let me just double check here. Um, so if I guess, uh, well, the question was if the range of brown pelicans have changed, but I'm not sure if it's the range of uh, where they are in um, terms of, I'm not sure, uh, home range or um, maybe Tabby can clarify um, as she was asking that question. Yeah, um, but if you want to clarify, yeah. that would be awesome. Um, but really <laughs> quickly, I can speak on home ranges. So we have recently found that um, on the different barrier islands, the pelicans that we have G uh, GPS tracks on, they will not cross each other's home ranges, which is pretty interesting. So they do have their own home ranges on any given island. Very cool. And speaking of GPS, so will your GPS be able to capture migratory movements? Unfortunately, we are too poor for that. <laughs> um, so the GPS only will last 
throughout the breeding season. And it's really only about two and a half months to three months that the GPS will last and then it just dies. So we don't have the fancy stuff because we don't have the money for the fancy GPS mm -hmm. trackers. But I wish we did. That would be awesome. Oh, so we have a clarification from Tabi. So she said, have they expanded the range where they breed or stay out of breeding season, like if they go farther north with climate change and things like that? Oh, okay. Um, they have not gone further north of like Louisiana, but maybe on the East Coast, I think some pelicans were spotted in like the Maryland area, the New York area, which is, pro it's probably gonna happen as you um, said, because of climate change, like they'll just keep moving up north a little bit. Um, but as far as we know, like they just migrate to Central America. Wait, so maybe we'll just, um, I, I'm sorry that we cannot answer all the questions because uh, we're kind of getting out of time, but maybe to wrap up, um, Luita, maybe you can tell us what inspired you to study birds. Um, and I know you mentioned a bit at the beginning, but maybe just for people that were not here, um, what, what inspired you to study birds in the beginning? Yeah, so I wasn't ever really sure what niche I would study or choose to study as a career, but my love for birds has to be that it's accessible to everyone, no matter where you are, whether you're in a concrete jungle or you're like out in the country somewhere, there's going to be birds around for the most part. So I feel like it's something that we could all share an appreciation for. Um, the birding community is awesome. And I really want to play my part in helping to conserve all bird species, um, not just pelicans, but they are my favorite. <laughs> so yeah, I think it's just birds are just this way that a, a bunch of people can help play a role in and advocate for. Hey, thank you. And kind of tying it into, you know, like um, Katie and I co-chair the um, Community Engagement Committee of the Audubon Chapter in Minneapolis. And uh, somebody here was asking if you know if brown pelicans are included in Louisiana school curricula or whether there have been education campaigns to help raise the public awareness about them. As far as I know, there has not been any, but Louisiana is, is a little bit like, they're not as into conservation as I would like them to be, especially as someone from California where we try to save everything possible. That is not the case in the state, to be frankly honest. Um, so yeah, there, I, there's not a lot of conservation happening. There is some, but it's not a lot. Great, well, thank you, Juita. I mean, I've, I cannot thank you enough for your presentation. I am before, I don't know if Katie has uh, some words to wrap up, but before we closed also, uh, I just wanted to make a couple of announcements, you know, related to our chapter. Uh, so we have um, community engagement committee uh, coming up on September 20th at 2.30 p.m. And if anybody's interested in joining, uh, you can check our website and either email Katie or myself and feel free to join us. And then we have in October, October 6th, we will have another program um, uh, by Zoom. And in this program, we don't have the details yet, but we will have a researcher from Honduras joining us. And it's from our migration partners collaboration that we have ongoing right now. And we will be, they will be talking about their banding station down in Honduras and about the birds that they banned over there and that migrate here and all the conservation problems that they face. So stay tuned because we will have more details coming up. And that's the couple of announcements I wanted to make. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but uh, maybe Juita, do you wanna tell us how people can find you perhaps? Um, I know you're in Twitter and actually, sorry, I, you just put it right down there. So ah, awesome. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Perfect. So, you know, if people have more questions or you wanna reach out to Juita, um, feel free. I follow you on Twitter, so now I know where you are. <laughs> and I will, I will pass the word to Katie. Thank you again. Um, uh, really fascinating stuff that you're doing. Thank you. Yes, thank you again so much from all of us at the chapter. And I, I like I said, everyone was so excited. And I think this is 
probably one of the programs that we have had the most questions. Um, so hopefully uh, we'll have people reaching out to you through social media. Um, I know you, you have a new website, right? Yes, I do have a website. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we will make sure to provide links to your website and uh, where people can reach you on social media, both on our website and on our Facebook page as well. Um, so people know where to go to learn more about your dinosaur flukes and all the great work that you're doing. Um, I also wanted to uh, quickly ask that any, if there are any students that uh, we're invited to participate in this session tonight by your teachers, uh, either in the chat section um, or in the Q&A section. Please type your name, the name of your school, your grade level, and your email address. Uh, because participating tonight actually means that you win some real cool bird nerdy prizes. So you're gonna get some stuff. You're gonna get some bird swag. Um, so again, it would be your full name, the name of your school, your grade level, and your email address. All right. Uh, Juita, is there anything else that you would like to plug before we sign off? No, I think that was it. But seriously, if anyone has any questions or like you need a mentor or you have questions about being a real scientist, I guess. <laughs> Please feel free to reach out. I check my DMs all the time. I check my emails all the time. Um, so yeah, please reach out. <laughs> awesome, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead and sign off and have a wonderful night and good luck with your uh, field season and the rest of your school year. We'll be thinking about you. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs> Take care. Bye.